Hello, a very good morning to everyone. I'm Harish from the Advocacy and Actions team at SBF, and I'm happy to be your MC for today. Welcome to our webinar titled, No Branch Left Behind, Enterprise Grade Security for SMEs and Small Branches. This morning, we are joined by security experts from ViewQuest and Palo Alto Networks in this webinar as they explore branch security and its potential weaknesses. They will also cover the changing needs for IT teams of a multi-branch business, entry points for cyber attackers, and how the majority of these threats can be easily prevented, and next-generation technologies and ML-powered solutions delivered as a service to security company branches. During this webinar, if you have any questions you'd like to be addressed, do key in the questions under the Q&A feature at the bottom bar. We will address these questions at the end of the webinar if time permits. Please also note that if you participate in any polls during the webinar, you also consent to sharing your information with ViewQuest and Palo Alto Networks. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Ms. Juris Francisco Gamban, Chief Marketing Officer of ViewQuest for the introduction on ViewQuest and Palo Alto. Ms. Juris, please. Morning, everyone. So let me just uh, share my screen first, okay? Can everyone see the screen, Haresh? Yes, we can see. Okay, hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you, Haresh, right? Um, I'm Juris, as Haresh mentioned, and I had marketing at ViewQuest. I'm really very glad to be here today, collaborating with the um, Singapore Business Federation and our partners in Palo Alto Networks to deepen cybersecurity awareness for small and mid-sized enterprises. Um, as a mid-sized business ourselves, compared to our larger friends in the telco industry, um, SMEs are actually a very important segment for us here at ViewQuest. So let me begin with a brief introduction about ViewQuest. So um, we are a trusted provider of telecommunications and information technology services. So we were founded and are headquartered in Singapore, and we have commercial operations in Malaysia and the Philippines. As a telco, we provide the full range of domestic and international connectivity, the full range of managed network services, and we also have a broad but specialized range of cybersecurity um, solutions. So most of us, uh, most of the people in the market, our customers know us as uh, an ISP. We are an ISP. We are, we in fact, have been recognized as the fastest ISP in Singapore for the last three years based on the UCLA Speed Test Awards, uh, which is based on millions of user-initiated tests. Um, among our peers and our enterprise and business customers, um, we have actually garnered a 4.8 uh, rating out of five um, for provision of our network services, our global network services, because we do uh, serve the large enterprises as well across connectivity and cybersecurity. Um, as for our cybersecurity services, uh, we have been recognized as a top managed security service provider by Enterprise Security Magazine. It's a global and regional publication focused on the cybersecurity industry. So, you know, while we are happy about the industry recognition, um, what we are really most proud of is the trust that our customers um, have given us. So we have been privileged to serve uh, connectivity and cybersecurity services to um, top multinational corporations um, and respected enterprises in Singapore, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Um, this is a representative mm -hmm. list. So this is uh, something that we're quite proud of um, um, co compared to, um, I mean, given the fact that as a mid-sized player ourselves, as I mentioned, um, our customers uh, do have a, a choice of going with the larger um, um, and more well-known um, telcos. So um, we have been equally privileged uh, to have a global leader such as Palo Alto Networks as our technology partner, specifically in cybersecurity. So um, with this partnership, uh, we have been able to provide um, bespoke solutions for large enterprises, simplified security services for consumers um, for our residential business, and security services designed specifically for um, SMEs. In fact, in the first half of this year, we launched a service called uh, SecureNet. 
So SecureNet, uh, biz for SMEs and SecureNet at home for uh, um, residences, uh, it's an advanced network security embedded in our broadband network. So when a customer activates it on their ViewQuest broadband line with no need for any hardware or software to be installed on their end, their office and their home networks are protected by Palo Alto's security technology that ViewQuest has installed in our network. So um, in line with this commitment to make advanced um, cybersecurity accessible to all our customers and not just large enterprises, we have recently launched the ViewQuest Secure Branch. Um, and this is the topic um, that we will be tackling today. Um, uh, this offering aims to provide enterprise-grade security for SMEs and small branches. Uh, effectively, we are bringing to market Palo Alto's latest series of next generation firewalls. Uh, and the solution was designed with a deep understanding of the cybersecurity risks and threats to small and mid-sized businesses. But I think most importantly, it's, uh, it makes, uh, we will be tackling the tools and resources available to uh, SMEs today uh, in order to protect themselves and to address the challenges of cybersecurity. Now, this is the area that our next speaker will be tackling, and I'm very pleased to be introducing him. So allow me to introduce my fellow speaker today, uh, Mr. Ian Lim. He is the Field Chief Security Officer for Asia Pacific and Japan at Palo Alto Networks. Ian has had 20 years of dedicated cybersecurity experience, and he has led global security departments for Fortune 100 companies across various industry verticals and across multiple continents. Ian is also a published author on information security management and is currently an executive committee member at the Cyber Research Policy Institute of his alma mater, the University of California, Irvine. On a more personal and uh, fascinating note though, um, and it's not here, but I will mention it, Ian likes to dabble in filmmaking and has in fact competed in some short film competition. So I think at this point, I'll turn it over to you, Ian. Great. No, thank you so much, Juris, for the introduction. Let me go ahead and uh, take control of the slides, if you don't okay. mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, no. OK, so a um, couple of other things that, that's not on the bio um, that is interesting um, is that I come from a family of entrepreneurs, um, much like yourself. They all own, you know, um, small, medium uh, enterprise. My sister owns um, a chain of wine stores in the in the U.S. Um, some of them own restaurants. So, um, outside of my uh, cybersecurity role um, in the company, I'm actually IT support for the family, right? You know, I'm sure some of you who are in IT um, know what I'm talking about. Um, but I, I bring this up to 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 tell you that I am very familiar with some of the challenges that you guys face um, on a personal note. And then, you know, to be able to bridge the enterprise stuff that we're going to be talking about today, right, um, into your branches. So, so hopefully uh, this, this session will be informative for you. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Um, for those of you who don't know Palo Alto, um, just, just kind of a quick recap, right? We're, we're the largest cybersecurity company um, in the world right now, um, used by 95 of the Fortune 100 companies. Um, you know, if you look at Gartner, Forrester, what have you, um, you know, we're, we're definitely up there. And, and you know, I, I just want to say one thing in, in terms of why we are where we are. Uh, we started out in the firewall world, if you will, but over the course of time, we really listened to our customers and we, we started to build not only um, the, the best firewall we could build, but we built uh, capabilities across the stack. You know, when our, when our customers needed to go um, and secure their remote branches, we built those capabilities. When they went to the cloud, we built those capabilities. And not only did we build them, um, but we were able to put them together in a, uh, in a very well and coordinated uh, um, and integrated platform uh, that gives us uh, that gives them a uh, very strong security and and ROI. So just just a quick introduction uh, on this. Uh, getting into kind of you know small and medium business, I, I think this is you know again you know my experiences with my family members etc. When I tell them I do security, they're like oh yeah you know cybersecurity is for the multinational corporations. You know the hackers are not looking at us right. I mean we're a small business. We don't really have a lot. 
et cetera, et cetera. And, and I know the gamut of SMEs range from, you know, um, you know, possibly mom and pop shop all the way to, you know, uh, companies with, with lots of branches. Um, I think, I think the line is under 10 million or hundred million. I'm not sure where, where, where the demarcation is now, but, um, but, but there's an, there's an idea that, Hey, you know, the hackers don't, don't want to um, hack us. They want to hack, you know, big, big companies. Um, and and it, it truly is a myth. Uh, at NUS, uh, your local university here did a study um, on SMEs uh, and some, some very, very astounding facts, right? You guys make up 99% of businesses in Singapore and you employ 70% of the workforce. That's a significant portion, you know, of this country's um, um, economy and, and this country's citizen. And, and you know, um, the cybersecurity uh, agency reported that 40% of the cyber attacks were actually targeted at you, um, at the SMEs. So not just um, multinational companies, right? Definitely um, targeting SMEs. Uh, here's another statistic that, that you know, from, is from the US, it's a, it's a couple of years old, um, but, but some amazing things, it, it, it's very similar, right? So 40% Singapore, almost 50% um, you know, in the US, um, uh, uh, and, and, and the, the astounding thing you know, that I saw here is as much as 60% of small and medium business that experience a data breach go out of business after six months. That's very worrisome. Um, and you know, with the state of ransomware attacks, et cetera, et cetera, you can see why that is the case. For example, if someone locks up your files and you know you are um, you know, you know, you're in finance, right? Someone locks up your ability to be able to produce um, the balance sheet uh, of your customers, um, or, or you know, if you're in, in, in a dental business, someone locks up all your files that have the, the whole you know, history of, of, of treatments for your, for your patients, it, it, it puts you in a very, very bad place. Um, and, and, and here's the other reason why, you know, you know five reasons why, right? Uh, the, the SMEs are targeted. They're easy and they're, they're lucrative. So uh, the, the hackers know that you guys are like, you know, less likely to have very strong cybersecurity, you know, capabilities. You probably don't have an IT security department um, or an IT security staff dedicated to securing your environment. Um, you rely a lot on third parties and IT contractors, which also might be a way in um, for them. Uh, there is no awareness training. So the employees are probably sharing, you know, the same password across the board to log on to uh, your, your capabilities. And the, the, the more recent thing and the more worrisome thing is that um, the hackers, the sophisticated hackers are looking at the supply chain and a lot of SMEs uh, supply to the multinationals. So you become a, 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 a good target for a supply chain attack as well. So, you know, again, you know, going back to the myth of uh, the idea that you guys are not targets, that is not true. Um, there's definitely a lot of reasons why you're targeted. Um, and, and I'll tell you some of these attackers. So, you know, you've got this small timers opportunists, you know, lying kind of in wait, right? They scan the internet for weak, uh, configurations, you know, so for example, if you've got a remote access configuration at your branch level that, you know, basically you put a box in, everything is default, they'll be able to scan it on the internet and easily get into, uh, into you know, your environment. So these are opportunists, they're not big timers per se, they, they look for easy, easy wins, right? So they're the ones that, that do the phishing. Um, when COVID hit, they're sending out mass um, amount of COVID phishing you know, um, um, emails uh, to be able to lure uh, 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 victims, right? Vishing is another word for voice phishing. I'm sure, you know, you guys get all those calls, you know, saying that your, 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 your credit card is over, you know, um, you know overrun, you, know, you, you owe money to the bank, et cetera, et cetera. And so these are all um, phishing attacks. Um, they're also deploying malware that automatically, you know, um, infects your system. And, and maybe automatically encrypts it. Basically ransomware, what we call ransomware 1.0, if you will, where everything is automated and then they'll send you a note and then you have to respond. Um, they, they're also very big on scamming. So um, business executive compromise is where they're trying to get in the middle of a wire transfer or a, you know, mon uh, uh, a monetary transaction so that they can have the money wired or sent to them. 
um, and and they 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 pretend to be an executive, you know, a, a CISO from from within your company, um, or you know, from outside your company. And then lastly, you know, some level of data theft. Um, but but these are, are, are small timers. They're just looking for easy targets. Um, you've got the big players. These guys are the ones that you see on the news, right? They're um, the the major um, um, organized crime units. Some of them are nation states or nation state sponsored. Um, they're doing what's called spear phishing. So, so they're targeting. So when I was talking to you about supply chain attack earlier um, against the SMEs, these are the big players that come at you. They're very well equipped um, because of the rise of Bitcoin value. I mean, they were you know, asking for Bitcoin five years ago when Bitcoin was like $3,000. Now Bitcoin's like, I don't know, forty dollars to $60,000. They made, they, they, they made money purely on appreciation of Bitcoin. They are well-funded. Um, they're going after um, accounts. Uh, they're going after targeted uh, ransomware attacks where they're taking down big multinational companies, sometimes coming in through um, smaller SMEs that support these um, companies. They're establishing, they're in, in, in infecting SMEs oftentimes for um, what, what's known as a bot network. So uh, think of it as being able to control a lot of computers so that you have a lot of computing power, but you're not doing anything with it yet until you're ready. So some of them sell their bot network, they rent them um, to do uh, denial of service attack. Uh, so they might look for um, small, small businesses that have little or no security takeover and just lie dormant um, you know, in, those, in, in those situations. Um, insider threats, they are, um, they're able and they can afford to and have um, bought um, employees. Um, and, and information um, as well as access uh, from employees uh, to be able to uh, attack companies. Um, and, and lastly, as I mentioned before, supply chain is, is really one of the key things um, that these big players are looking at uh, today. Um, but, but all this to say that there are you know, um, these opportunistic you know, small timers that are, are hitting SMEs um, for, for quick hits. And then there are these big players that are looking at SMEs more as a, um, as a, a um, as a stepping stone, you know, to, to a bigger play. And then there, there's a third group. Um, I, I probably don't, don't think you'll, you'll see a lot of that here. Um, those are called the hacktivists. And those guys don't hack for money. Uh, they hack for, you know, a purpose, right? So like website defacement, um, uh, shameware, and things like that, those are all really targets of hacktivists where they want to bring shame or they want to bring negative attention uh, to a specific company that's usually more targeted typically at MNCs and, and you know, MNCs in other parts of the world. Um, um, you know, not, uh, I haven't seen a lot of that in Singapore, but, but the two, two, two big guys that you should worry about are, are the opportunists and the big players. Um, and I got this, this um, uh, st uh, survey from UOB and, and you know, what, what's interesting here um, as you look at, at, at um, SMEs and the adoption of technology, is that right in the middle, right? It's, it's saying that those, those SMEs who've digitalized more in 2020 saw a higher revenue growth. And I don't know how much of that, you know, are, are you guys out in the listener. I mean, you're obviously listening to us today because you have, you know, a concern around cybersecurity and probably because you are really relying more and more on technology to grow your business. Um, and, and because technology is now uh, a major instrument, not only for SMEs, obviously for the big national, uh, multinational companies as well. Um, it's very, very important to protect it. My analogy typically is, you know, for cybersecurity is, you know, think of it as kind of your modern electric safe car, right? You, the car is meant to get you from A to B, right? That's kind of your, your growth. You, know, you, you want to get someplace fast. You want to get someplace, you know, um, you know, maybe comfortably, right, luxury. Um, but more important than anything, you want to get to the place safely, right? That's the key thing is, is so you know, cybersecurity is the seatbelt. Cybersecurity is the LIDAR, you know, that, that you know, you know your anti-brake locking system, et cetera, et cetera. It's, the, it's kind of the, the, the components that keep you safe as you kind of take this journey, you know, towards growth, towards the cloud, you know, towards digitization. So um, the role of cybersecurity is, 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 is necessary, given the, the landscape that we're looking at, given the threat actors that we have today. 
Um, so here's kind of, you know, I, I wanted to break down some practical advice for you guys, again, you know, coming from, from you know, a family of entrepreneurs. Um, so, so these are kind of the three areas I want you to think about, right? So before you start doing anything with cybersecurity, the best way is to take, uh, to assess your risk. Because all, all businesses are not, you know, the same. They, they, you know, again, the SMEs uh, fall in such a large bracket. You could be a, a you know, um, you know, you could be a small business out of a, a um, you know, a hawker center, right? Um, that that's basically just using um, a, a PayPal or, or a PayNow. I think you guys call it here, PayNow, right? So very little technology. You could be a you know a, a small um, investment company that's using a lot of technology. So very very broad risk. And so my recommendation is you know you might you might not have IT security guys on staff. Um, but you can hire these point solutions, someone to come in and take a look at your uh, technology, especially if you're going to invest in technology as a launching platform for you to grow your business. Have them look at the security. You know, are you guys uh, you're better in the cloud? Are you guys better on premise? Do you guys need all these computers, et cetera, et cetera? So, um, you know, have, have an expert come in and look and, and give you a security assessment um, and maybe even an IT assessment to figure out what to do. Two, validate your business continuity. Now, I say this because we live in an age where ransomware is highly lucrative um, for these um, attackers. They're getting so much money. Back in the day, they would hack, like, say, credit cards. They get these credit card numbers and they'll give it to what we call mules to go run the credit card at gas stations. I mean, can you imagine how slow that money is, you know, in terms of rolling in that you've got so many people that you have to kind of pay off to get, you know, your return on investment. Ransomware, you stop a business call in their tracks, right? Your logistic business, you can't move pieces. Your dental business, as I said before, you can't treat patients, et cetera, et cetera. And when you stop them, then they have no choice but to pay you ransom. Now, here's what a lot of people don't know, especially in, you know, um, people who've not faced um, these um, ransom attackers firsthand, you might not actually get the decryption key. Not all ransom paid result in the decryption of your data. Okay, I'll say it again. Not all ransom paid result in the decryption of your data. So you don't know who you're dealing with. Some of these, so all these different ransomware um, folks um, almost have a profile. And when, when we are dealing with negotiating with these ransomware, um, with these um, ransomers, um, we look at their profile, whether they you know, deliver the, the, the key or not. Obviously, you want to deliver the key, but some of them are, are not that they're malicious, but they might not have their technology down uh, for many, many reasons, which is why I would say that one of the things that you always have to focus on you know, in your business is how you back up your data and is your data safe? Is there a copy of your data that you need to do your business safely in your hand? And is, it, is there a rigor around keeping it safe and keeping it updated, right? Every business is different. I don't know how your business um, might work. And there's a lot of different ways you can back up data. You can, you know, um, you know, you can back it up to a thumb drive. You could run, you know, um, backup software. You can hire an MSS to do it. Many, many different ways. But the bottom line is as a business owner, as a business executive team, management team, you need to figure out how you run your business, especially in light of, you know, a ransomware attack, for example. Um, so um, think about that. And, and get solutions around it because these are, are literally um, the lifeline of your business. Um, thirdly, um, cyber insurance. Now, this is cyber insurance is much bigger in the States. I'm not sure where the state of cyber insurance in Singapore is, but let me give you a little bit of picture in terms of what cyber insurance should do, right? And, and, and does in the US. So cyber insurance, um, you know, gives you the ability to quickly um, access funds in the beginning of an event. You know, when you find out you've been breached, you want a forensics team to immediately come down and stop the bleeding for you, shore up and give you a clean bill of health so you can continue to operate. That takes money and that takes expertise that you, you know, so, so you can spend that money, you can figure it out, but usually 
<clears throat> if you partner with the cyber insurance, they have people that they know because, you know, obviously they've got other customers that use the service. So, so you know, they're able to help you not only pay for that, but help you find the right experts to get your business back up and running again. Um, cyber insurance also helps, you know, some of them, depending on how you negotiate your, your premium, um, might help with loss of business. Um, cyber insurance might also help with, you know, um, um, you know, um, giving you a, 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 you know, protection against lawsuits, right? So, so again, all, it depends on how you negotiate with them, but ultimately you, you need to kind of look into it. I'm not saying go buy it, but you know, if you haven't looked into it, given kind of, again, the threat landscape, the targeted, you know, ness of, of SMEs, something to consider um, as a you know, overall layer of protection for you. Um, some of the low-hanging fruits, right, that you can immediately do without spending a lot of money, okay? Multi-factor authentication. Uh, Multi-factor authentication has saved so many um, a company, uh, big or small, and individuals from breach, from account takeovers. Multi-factor authentication, as you guys know, is, you know, I, I, you know so, so I, I've just recently moved to Singapore about five months. I'm Absolutely proud of the Singaporean government and the way that they've rolled out, you know, um, um, MFA and, and single sign-on. And, and, and I, I think that because of that, you guys are very familiar with it. Everything I do has an MFA component. Um, basically, you get not only you use your username and password, but you use, you know, a, you know, a, you know an authenticator or an SMS message back to you um, as a second factor of authentication. Now, when I talk to SMEs, when I talk to my family members who own these businesses, I say this, right? The email account that you use to do a lot of your business, you better put that on multi-factor um, authentication. If you're using, you know, even if you're using Google, Yahoo, what have you, every one of them have multi-factor authentication. All your bank accounts better have multi-factor authentication. Anywhere you have a huge contact list, like your social media accounts, et cetera, et cetera you should have multi-factor authentication. And all the platforms that I've talked about, anyone that's kind of industry standard, they all have multi-factor authentication available to you to, you to turn it on. Um, so you should always turn it on. Any, you know, and, and within your business, you probably have, um, you know, production systems, right? Systems that actually transact your business, be it a, you know, a, a retail, you know, um, log on your credit card systems, your order taking systems, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure you turn on multi-factor authentication um, in those, right? Don't share passwords because sharing passwords means that you don't know who did what. And if the password is shared between more than one person, once that password is lost, you have to change that password or affect the, the, the business, right? So should go without saying that you guys should not share passwords and that you guys should turn on multi-factor authentication Cost you no money, typically, okay? Policies and procedures. This is another area that is, um, you know, key, right? You know, most of you guys are, um, probably institute some level of um, standard operating procedures for your business. Um, but I, I challenge you to think about security standard operation, uh, operation procedures, uh, operating procedures that will really protect your company. Case in point, I just said that. Policy. No sharing of passwords, right? Everybody gets an individual account so it can be tracked. Um, you cannot share passwords. And one way you can make them not share passwords is activate multi-factor authentication. Passwords can't be shared in an MFA situation. Very hard, okay? That's one. Two, when you give people access, I know a lot of you rely on third-party contractors, you know, your IT support help, you know, MSS uh, for the bigger SMEs. Make sure you have a strong policy around remote access. And again, two-factor authentication for remote access, right? Make sure that, you know, you keep that list um, updated, you know, are the third parties that are accessing your uh, environment, um, are, you know, are you vetting that access list on a regular basis? Make sure that, that you do that. Um, you know, other procedures like locking your laptop, not posting passwords, you know, in front of the screen so that anybody who's like, you know, in the vicinity of your work area can see it. Um, these are uh, 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 procedures that you can implement 
uh, again, you know, pretty much without cost. It, it, there's a cost of administration, obviously, but it will save you a lot. And then lastly, um, awareness training. Like, are you teaching your people not to just click on links, especially if they sound too good to be true? Okay, um, in my security awareness training at, at, at you know, the companies that I've been a chief security officer for, um, I, you know, I, I, I tell them that if anything is unexpected, if anything you know, is urgent, if anything is unusual, the three U's, right? Always check and confirm, okay? And you know, unexpected, like you get a sum, you know, you, you got a sum of money or you, know, you haven't heard from this person in a long time and all of a sudden they're writing you, okay? Unusual, again, unexpected, unusual. Unusual is like the content is a bit strange. Unexpected, it comes in a very odd time that you're not having a conversation all of a sudden it comes. You know, and so you know, have a have a radar, right? And trust your gut. If this thing is too good to be true, right? It, it probably is. So check and confirm. When you check and confirm, um, make sure you pick up the phone and call the person out of your contact list. Don't click on links in the email. Go outside to the normal. Like, say for example, you get an email from a from your bank saying that you have a bounced check, right? Don't click on the link in the email. Go to the normal way that you go to a bank or, you know, even Google them and then call your bank directly and say, hey, you know, um, do I actually have a bounce check? So these are awareness training that you can, um, you know, raise it within your, um, your company so that the, that the layered, the layered defense of, of um, you know, um, the human factor uh, is in strongly in place. And again, none of this requires you to buy any new technology. You're literally just kind of taking a proactive measure. Now there is, you know, the next generation capabilities um, that that really helps with um, leveraging the new development in technology and in cybersecurity to protect your business. So you know, we're definitely going to talk to you about the next generation firewalls. I think Juris um, will we'll, we'll deep dive a little bit on that. I'll talk a little bit on that. But the idea here is that we've we've basically we know that SMEs have a staffing issue, right? You know, and then by the way, not only SMEs but multinational companies have a staffing issue in cybersecurity. So we're trying to make our tools as smart as they possibly can to do a the bulk of the work of protection so that you guys don't have to. Um, and, um, and I'll go into deep uh, details. Again, same thing with the next gener generation threat prevention, you know, the ability for you to be able to deploy, you know, not just your antivirus software anymore, but, you know, we call ours, um, you know, um, endpoint detection and response. Uh, basically, it, it's, it's, it's kind of the next generation antivirus that, that knows how to detect attacks on your endpoint. For example, I'm sure some of you heard of SolarWinds, um, the recent major supply chain attack that happened um, last year. Um, our tool, our, our antivirus or our next generation antivirus capability was able to, to stop that even without knowing what it was, you know, because, because of the advancement in machine learning, the, the advancement that we've put into uh, correlating the threat, you know, in, in a broader ecosystem. And then lastly, you know, really think about next generation remote access. If you're still using things like TeamViewer, et cetera, et cetera, you should really think about how to secure, um, you know, uh, access, you know, into your environment. Um, and I have one slide just to give you a flavor of what the next generation capabilities look like. Um, so, you know, one of the key things around the, 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 the idea of next generation is that we leverage machine learning and artificial intelligence a lot. Um, and, you know, imagine that, you know, I said earlier that we were deployed to, to many, many companies. I, I think about 50,000 companies in the world. When we see an attack on any one of those companies, um, we're able to use our cloud technology to analyze it um, and, and, and basically um, um, look at the threat telemetry and the signature and then deploy that signature to inoculate all the customers. So if we see something in the wild, right, we're able to inoculate everyone else so, so that everyone else is not impacted or affected by it. So that's a, a very powerful immune system um, that is only leverageable, you know, if you use next generation capabilities. 
Um, the other thing is cloud. We deliver a lot of these capabilities in the cloud. So while the firewall sits in your environment, a lot of its power comes from cloud processing. And because it comes from cloud processing, you're not paying for all that processing power at the branch, right? You're not paying for that. We're using the big data technology, all the, all the compute that we need to be able to crunch very, very um, um, uh, uh, advanced telemetry data from, from um, events that we see from all firewalls. And then, you know, again, push down from the cloud to your um, firewall to protect you. So there, there are all these capabilities that, that you, know, you're, you're, you don't have IT staff. We have, you know, you are leveraging our cybersecurity expertise um, to protect your environment, um, uh, which also helps you lower your risk. And ultimately you will, you will get cost savings in many ways, right? For one, right, higher protection, lower likelihood of attack, lower likelihood of attack, lower spend on dealing with the aftermath um, of an attack. Um, also, you know, again, bringing all these tools that you would have to otherwise buy different point solutions for um, into a, a, a you know, unit that can basically have threat prevention, you know, IoT security, et cetera, et cetera, DLP, data leakage prevention, um, you know, bringing all these capabilities into a firewall uh, to give you um, that breadth of protection, right? You know, so uh, again, not you don't have to buy point solutions. You can kind of buy an integrated next generation tool. Um, and with that, you know, that, and this is my last slide, but um, again, you know, I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. So uh, we can talk about um, those questions during the Q&A session. Um, I'll pass the time back to Juris. I'll, Thank I'll you, stop Ian. sharing my screen. <clears throat> Thanks, Ian. So let me just share mine so I can start. All right. So, um, well, Ian, thank you for um, generously sharing your expertise and experience. I, I actually want to um, echo um, um, this uh, portion um, that you mentioned, particularly like the cybersecurity framework, if you like you know, that SMEs can take as an approach to cybersecurity. Um, so, and this one is like starting with a risk assessment. Um, and it's really about understanding, understanding where you are, where your business is, what your needs are, right? Because uh, not all businesses are the same. Not all businesses have the same number of employees, devices, um, the types of data that goes in and out of the network, right? Um, and you need to understand which points um, um, are points of vulnerability. Um, that, that need to be secured. Um, and then of course, the low hanging fruits, which are, you know, it's not even about investing in any technology, but really just investing in the time uh, uh, to, to put in the, the right processes and the right awareness for, um, for employees uh, in order to basically um, kind of like best practice, right? You know, observe uh, safety, security in your own um, 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 operations in your own day to day pretty much how one would do it, for example, at home, you'd lock, you'd not allow anyone to just come inside. It's kind of like, okay, you wouldn't just allow anything to come inside your network, right? And click or open anything that comes your way. Um, and then of course, what really complements this is the available tools out there, you know, um, referring to them as the next generation tools. Um, and uh, this is one of the, the areas where, um, well, V and ViewQuest are you know, quite happy to be partnered with Palo Alto in this respect, to be able to bring these types of solutions um, to our customers. Because, you know, as a, as a, as, as a service provider for connectivity, um, we are actually one of the first and most foundational, if you like, tech partner of an SME, right? Putting in their broadband connection, um, or eventually as they graduate to more um, sophisticated uh, um, high bandwidth uh, data connections. But we are kind of like the first tech partner. And um, a lot of times uh, uh, we, our customers actually approach us and, and ask us to help them, okay, um, how do I secure my network? Um, um, I, or I got, uh, I got affected. Um, in fact, one of our um, vendor partners actually um, got hit uh, last year. 
um, with the cybersecurity attack. And um, first person they go to, first company they go to is, hey, ViewQuest, as my broadband provider, could you help me address this? Um, so this is something that you know we feel is a is a is a natural extension of our service to um, our customers being the connectivity partner. Now we would like to make accessible cybersecurity um, solutions, um, the best that we could offer in partnership with Palo Alto to our customers. And this is why we launched um, Secure Branch, um, specifically for securing um, branches for small and mid-sized companies or. Um, even for large enterprises, but they're smaller branches, right? So, I mean, uh, I think the, the, the three points here um, address uh, so some of the points you mentioned earlier, Ian, about, uh, you know, it's the, it's the challenge um, uh, that uh, SMEs face in terms of addressing cybersecurity. I mean, the threats are out there, phishing, ransomware, malware, and all that. But there are operating challenges faced by our small and mid-sized um, uh, customers, right? So the first is um, sensitive customer data, regardless of how small the branch is, right, uh, or how remote that is, it it it, it does handle receive uh, uh, um, sensitive customer data, and it has to be secured. In fact, these smaller branches um, can serve as a backdoor if they're not adequately protected. They can serve as a backdoor um, um, for cyber attacks. Right, because we're thinking, okay, like you, like you started in your presentation earlier, Ian. Right, um, we don't think we are we're vulnerable. Um, okay, I'm a small branch. I'm a, you know, maybe like a pop-up store uh, in a mall, so I'm not I'm not vulnerable. But actually, there are um, this this particular outlet does handle sensitive customer data, financial transactions. Um, if there's a rewards kiosk there, customer data is there as well. And we need to put in enterprise-grade security even at that uh, location. The next is uh, limited IT resources, which you also touched earlier, Ian. Um, so, you know, uh, where you might have IT resources in a smaller mid-sized company, but usually they're at, at HQ, right? Um, and it's very uh, uh, difficult to have to um, deploy uh, um, um, resources and, and ensure, for example, when you need to set up security or you need to make a change in the security policy and all that. Now, um, a, a next generation solution would provide for um, centralized branch network security management. Uh, and remote configuration, allowing a, essentially uh, the IT uh, uh, team to manage the security policies and enforce them from HQ. Um, and then of course you have servicing remote locations and this would include remote locations or smaller locations where space is a constraint, right? Distance and space could be a constraint. Um, and you might wanna, um, the, the, the right solution, the, the, the adequate solution for um, a situation like this is to have one um, where the, the form factor, the appliance that you would put in the branch, for example, um, is resilient. There are less or no moving parts even um, would be perfect because that will, that will reduce the, the repair or uh, maintenance that would be required. At the same time, being smaller, it will have multiple mounting options. You could actually put it in um, a desktop, right? You could put it in a small space because this, these branches are in fact um, space constrained. So this is what I was saying earlier about how um, uh, the, the, the solutions that, that, that Palo Alto um, um, has come up with uh, has been designed specifically uh, with, with the sensitivity to these kinds of needs, right, for um, smaller businesses. And um, the Viewpa Secure branch effectively features the PA400 series. This is what we're launching as part of this offering. Um, um, Ian has mentioned already, um, you know, this features basically machine learning powered next generation firewalls, all the efficiencies, five times faster booting, up to 10 times higher performance. You know, all of these are essentially the features of the uh, firewall appliance itself that you would put um, in the branch. But I think um, what I'd like to touch on is how ViewQuest has, um, is bringing this to the market um, to make it accessible. Um, so um, we're delivering this uh, as firewall as a service. So essentially, um, it's a subscription-based service where um, uh, the um, small and mid-sized enterprises can get enterprise-grade security, and you can just have flexible security add-ons as part of um, um, the service, such as you know threat prevention, um, wildfire malware prevention. The ones at the bottom can 
talk about that um, 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 later on, um, you know, if uh, there's more detailed um, interest and need for it. But essentially, it's really a stackable um, solution that we just as bringing to market. Um, and it comes, of course, with uh, simplified deployment and management that's inherent to um, the, the product itself. Um, but uh, taking it from ViewQuest um, allows us to help you um, um, businesses uh, like um, SMEs, right, um, by providing managed services um, or professional services, which is like a, on a one-off basis uh, if you need configuration or setup. Managed services would be on an ongoing basis as part of the um, subscription. And I think uh, what uh, we really wanted to do here um, is to deliver the service at a monthly cost um, for uh, small and mid-sized businesses instead of um, delivering it as an upfront hardware investment. Um, and then uh, um, again, making these types of next generation solutions, advanced technologies, right, um, available and more accessible um, to small and mid-sized businesses, like it or not, right, um, uh, uh, aside from the operational constraints are also budget limitations. Um, so, um, and, 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 as, uh, as Ian said, right? So while cybersecurity is that seatbelt and all that, right? So um, that allows us to, you know, get to where we're going safely and all that. But um, I mean, in the wild, there is a, actually the, our market research has shown um, and even um, the, the studies um, shared with us by the cybersecurity agency, there is in fact a high awareness for cybersecurity risks and threats but the adoption of um, solutions and services is still quite low, um, whether it be on the process side or whether it be on the technology side. Um, and we really, one of the biggest hurdles is the complexity um, and the cost. So um, by bringing an, an elegant and simplified solution um, and making it accessible cost-wise, um, we are hoping that this allows us to um, serve our SMEs better. So um, this actually wraps up, um, I think, our, our, our session, our presentation. Um, and I think I'd like to turn it over to Haresh at this point um, for some uh, for the rest of it. Sure. Thank you, Juris and Ian, for the um, wholesome sharing. In fact, uh, we'd like to just conduct a quick poll to hear from you. I think um, you've been downloading quite a lot of information. So we're just going to launch this very quick poll of two questions. Um, which you will be able to see on your screen right now. The first question is, what do you think are the most common cybersecurity in incidents that have affected SMEs? And the second question, what are your top security concerns for your main offices and branches? Um, do fill up this uh, two questions and we'll kickstart our Q&A shortly. Thanks, Haresh. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, as folks are filling that out, you know, uh, we've seen some Q&A um, uh, questions come into our box. Um, so I'll, I'll just start taking some of them um, on. So Brandon Lee asked um, how individual devices can be protected outside the office, you know, like in the case of work from home. VPN has been an issue lately with ransomware attacks. So is there anything better? Also, endpoint management on user devices outside the office is very delicate due to the Data Protection Act? Is there a way to manage surf websites and connected USB or wireless devices on endpoints without intruding on privacy? Very, very good questions, Multi, multi-faceted. And I think he asked another one as well around you know, um, uh, how to prevent piggyback session during um, a VPN session where the session TLS certificate resides on the devices itself. Okay, all right. So Brandon, a couple of things. Um, I, I think, you know, first of all, uh, it, it's gonna be a, a much longer conversation, but, but I'll say this. So um, there, there are many, many different strategies to protecting the endpoint. I, you, I, I think based on the way you're framing your question, you're, you're, you, you're talking more about the bring your own device scenario, but, but let's, let's, let me cover both. Right. So BYOD. Uh, so you know, if you want to protect the endpoint device, you know, the best way obviously is if you have control of the device. So if you're if it's a, a corporate issued or a, a business issued laptop, then you're able to protect. Uh, then you're able to put all the endpoint protection on it. You're able to put the VPN software, make sure it's updated, etc. VPN for the most part. It, it still works, especially coupled with multi-factor authentication. VPN's problems has more to do with you know, the security settings, the security policies on the back end, 
when you log in, you know, you, you basically are somewhat limited depending on the VPN solution you use to, you know, IP ranges on the back end, right? Are there better solutions? The multinational, uh, what we're starting to do with a lot of companies is a better solution um, called SASE. So Secure Access um, uh, Service Edge um, is where we're going, you know, in terms of the next evolution of remote access. And SASE gives you the ability to connect not only your end users, your third party, your branch, um, it pulls all that capability into a centralized firewall, uh, which has, again, all the next generation features that you see. So while VPNs, don't have a lot of those inline inspection being done necessarily, depending again on how you configure your VPN. The SASE solution enables you to be able to do that deep inspection. Again, not all SASE are created equal. I'm just talking you know, specifically of our SASE. It, uh, it enables you to create that deep inspection you know, that, we, that we do um, within our next generation firewalls um, across all that traffic. And then from that, um, SASE middle point, you know, we can point you to a, to a data center, we can point you to um, a SaaS provider, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, if, if you want to know more about SASE, definitely reach out to Juris, reach out to myself. We can, we can have someone talk to you about that. But that's, again, more for a big branch, um, you know, multi-branch operations, et cetera. The other advantage, key advantage to SASE um, for, um, for companies is that we put the point of presence in the countries that they're in. So they're not backhauling VPN traffic all the way, say for example, to Singapore, but you know, say, if they're in Indonesia, we have a pop in Indonesia, et cetera, et cetera. So they jump on and um, you know, uh, directly to us. Now to answer the um, other parts of your question, what do you do with, with BYOD and, and how do you secure that? Um, it's a bigger strategy. So, the, I, so I'll tell you what I've done in the past. What I've done in the past is, I move all our capabilities to the internet, right? So that I have very, very low reliance on the endpoint. And ultimately what I was doing in my company was I was pushing for Chromebooks because a fully loaded laptop, you know, in the States is like $4,500. A fully loaded Chromebook is like $1,000, right? So my CTO, my CFO, they were all really happy with the idea. But not only that, if you look at the CVEs, which is the attack vectors on Chromebooks versus you know, a MacBook or you know, especially a Windows, the, the, the CVEs on a Chromebook is very, very low. So, the, the, so, the, uh, so basically what I'm saying is that the, there's not a lot of people attacking Chromebooks, but that, that has a prerequisite of moving a lot of your business apps to the web. And then on the website, right, the SaaS provider side, you have the ability, depending on the company, so um, if you're talking about like Google or Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera, typically the, we have capabilities that gives you management and threat detection through APIs in through the SaaS provider. So like we have it for Salesforce, we have it, you know, I think for Box and a couple other major players. So you push all the endpoint users to a Chromebook platform where you lower kind of the attack surface, you push them onto a browser, and then you create multi-factor authentication to log on to whatever browser capabilities. And then on the browser capability, uh, on the kind of the SaaS capability, you use um, security API tools to monitor usage and anomalies, et cetera. So ultimately that's what I would recommend um, uh, you head to. Um, and th that sort of answers the whole VPN weakness issues and the TLS certificate issues. You don't even have to worry about all that because you're really leaning um, much harder on, you know, just your normal, you know, um, SSL um, as opposed to really relying hard on that device um, security. Okay. I think that, that's, that's a long answer, long answer for that. It was uh, a quite, uh, quite a rich question as well. <laughs> yeah, it's multi-layered, so I want to make sure I give it justice. Yeah. I can, uh, I can pick up uh, one of the questions as well. Um, um, so this is from Bob Lowe, should you see? Um, so uh, by virtue of the fact that all software and SMEs are by and large installed by software consultants with the assistance of the IT, wouldn't it be appropriate for cybersecurity experts to work with these professionals rather than with company management? So it, it's actually not either, it, it's actually um, not, not one or the other, right? Um, so it works very well. We've actually done this at Newquest where we've been part of a total deployment 
um, for uh, software consultants, uh, for example, for one of our large um, um, conglomerate uh, customers, <clears throat> they were doing a, a, a big uh, deployment for um, their productivity suite. Um, and they uh, were, they also wanted to um, um, upgrade or change out their endpoint solution the endpoint security solution and UQuest was part of that whole um, um, implementation. So that's one way to, to do it. Another way really also, especially for the small and mid-sized um, companies, um, where, uh, like I said, the IT department is quite small, management is heavily involved in these IT decisions. Um, and uh, we often need to work very closely um, um, with management itself. Um, so both IT and uh, uh, the commercial side Right where these decisions are made, um, so it's it's uh, it can work both ways, um, and both uh, really depends on the the uh, the company. And I think in, in in relation, maybe I'll pick up also. This is from an anonymous attendee regarding um, uh, with a limited IT budget. Can you advise which are the first critical areas to prioritize for cybersecurity? So um, I think from from the the session or from the session earlier, right, especially on the part that Ian showed. Um, the first step is really on risk assessment. I mean, cybersecurity is so broad. The points of vulnerability have just, um, or the, the, uh, the, the attack surface, as it's often called, has, has gotten so big, right? So endpoints or devices that we use, the different, you know, IoT, all of these sensors that we are we have installed in, in, in our um, offices, um, not to mention all the usual um, devices connected to the network. They can be printers, copiers, and all the laptops out there. And with bring your own with BYOD as well, that just practically increases um, um, the attack surface. So um, really it's about, okay, take a step back as a small company with limited resources. Okay, what, what uh, take an ID audit, right? Um, and again, um, that could be done yourself or you could you could uh, work with someone like Bequest um, to help with that. Uh, uh, the ID audit means, okay, what are the devices that are connecting to the network? What are the all the different software applications and what have you that are being used in the company? Right, um, and a couple of other things will be included there, right? To help understand the points of vulnerability. And then from there, you can make an informed decision which areas um, um, you'll do first. Uh, if you can do all, that's great. But otherwise it's which areas do we need to do first where you need to protect your um, business first and foremost. No, great answer. Um, four minutes left. Let me quickly hit the last one. I currently have another brand of firewall installed in my office. How is the next gen firewall different? And what are the tangible advantages versus existing? So I, I think I mentioned this in, in, in the presentation. The next gen, the, so, so maybe I should start with the, the, the old generation firewall is largely an IP firewall. Basically, you're saying, okay, you know what, if you're from this IP, then you know you can connect to this IP on these services and protocols. That's kind of very very basic, and for the most part, that's still a lot of the firewalls that are being kind of, um, um, rolled out in SMEs. The next generation firewalls relies on machine learning and AI and cloud delivered capabilities in order to to bolster your um, immunity, if you will, um, from the latest types of attacks. Right, so um, you're not going to get that with the first gen. Yeah, you're just not. So um, that's that's the next gen. And then you know, with three minutes left, let's look at the poll questions. Um, what do you think of the cybersecurity incidents that, that affects SMEs? Phishing attacks and online scams, absolutely. This is, this is very, very consistent. And again, mm -hmm. you know, the next generation firewall has built in content filters, um, advanced content filters that stops you know, phishing links um, from, uh, from being um, clicked on um, inside uh, your environment. Um, not foolproof. Other capabilities is you, you probably could, there are phishing um, um, kind of filter uh, companies uh, that, that I've used in the past uh, that basically you route the mail to them. They will rewrite the URL in your mail so that when your, your mail comes to your employees or yourself, that URL is now, when, you, when people click on it, it doesn't infect your system. It actually detonates in the cloud, in that kind of phishing, uh, in that uh, um, email protection server, you know, in the cloud. There are capabilities like that. So if phishing is a major concern, uh, definitely look into it. But you know what? What helps the most in phishing? Awareness and training. Bar none. That 
doesn't cost you any money. You really, you know, I, I mean, if you want, you can, you know, download some CBTs online as well to kind of train your, your, your CBTs, computer-based training, to train your folks up on it. Uh, malware and virus attacks, again, uh, a, a really strong next generation firewall technology and a really strong endpoint uh, technology that ho hopefully talks to your firewall um, will help you protect against that or take the approach I told Brandon, you know, start pushing more of your capabilities into the cloud um, and then give them basically a browser based you know, um, platform so that you, you don't get hit by it. And ransomware, you guys are not targeted yet. Yeah, 36% is, is still, you know, uh, a decent number. And, and again, focus on your business continuity there. Um, one minute, <laughs> top concerns, um, yeah, sensitive information, et cetera. So uh, the next generation firewall also has a DLP data leakage prevention capability. So um, especially to do with sensitive information, it can auto detect that. All right, 11 o'clock, I'll give it back to Harash. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Jurist, for the wonderful sharing this morning. Um, in fact, we'd like to share with all participants that the uh, presentation materials will be also made available to you post-webinar. Uh, so if you do have further questions uh, with uh, ViewQuest and also Palo Alto, feel free to also let us know. And uh, thank you for joining us this morning. And we also like to thank our speakers for availing their time and expertise in sharing the pertinent topics relevant to our SMEs. So thank you once again for joining us and please do scan this QR code that you see on the screen uh, to also let us know your thoughts and feedback as we shape up more topics relevant to you. Thank you and have a great day ahead. Thank Thanks you all. Thank Bye. You.